Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report, episode 205. I am your host, Michael. Joining me this week, I'm Gail from Communities Digital News, uh, Bo from Truth and Facts, straight off of vacation, uh, Daniel from the Inscriber, Jacob from Jab Hook. Uh, what's going on, ladies and gents? Hey, 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 it's going to be a busy show. Hope you're all tuned in nice and early. Yeah, just when you thought boxing was going to be boring, um, nothing happening. Um, over the weekend and particularly over the last 24 hours, a lot has transpired. Uh, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, um, weekly YouTube show, podcast, and as well as a blog discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. If you want to find out all the information regarding Pound for Pound Box Report, the blog page is the place to go to, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. That's the link. Check the right of the page. You can find links for all our channels and pages on Twitter, G+, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, even got a Pinterest board. I don't mention it enough because I don't update it as often as, as I should. Um, also, you can find links to where to listen to the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play Music, uh, Stitcher Radio, Player FM for the folks in the UK, as well as Mixcloud. Um, let's get the show started. Like I said, uh, just when box you thought boxing was going to be rather slow over the past weekend, um, surprise, surprise. I'm going to start off in Japan um, specifically. I should have mentioned these fights last week in hindsight. Um, I regret that I did not. Um, let's start. It was, has to be considered one of the upsets of the year so far. Um, Diego Higa, um, been a sensation um, down at 112 pounds. Um, he was to defend his belt over in Yokohama, Japan against a rather nondescript opponent by the name of Christopher Rosales. Well, uh, turns out the day before the fight, uh, Higa and was becoming a uh, bad trend in boxing, failed to make weight. Came in 114 pounds, two for pounds over the 112 pound limit. Uh, was given two hours time to try to make weight. He could not. Um, so not only did he not make the weight, he lost, was stopped, TKO9. Um, yeah, I'm going to you, Gail. Nobody expected this. Are you there, Gail? Hey, Mike, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. I must have been got disconnected. I'll just go back over again. Um, yeah, Diego Higa. Uh, on the one hand, he, he failed to make weight. Um, then he compounded failing to make weight by um, losing the fight as he was uh, upset, stopped in nine by one Christopher Rosales. I'll go back to you, Gail. Hopefully you can hear me this time. Uh, who expected this? I don't think Gail is there, so I go to you, Bo. Uh, your thoughts? <laughs> you know, man, this he was lost. He, oh, Gail, he was Gail. defeated. <laughs> hey, Gail, we, Gail, we didn't, we didn't hear anything you said. We don't know what was going on. We're just not hearing you now. So go ahead, Gail. Oh, is that right? Okay, I'm just now starting up. You're hearing me all right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well. You have to conduct the fights, no matter what the odds, no matter how lopsided you think the outcome's going to be, because occasionally something like this happens. Now, true, when a man doesn't make weight, especially in the lower weight divisions where there's very, very little margin for error, you don't know how it's affected their condition unless there's something obvious in front of you. I think back to Luis Neri, you know, passing out after trying to make weight. To my knowledge, nothing like that happened prior, but we don't really know what happened in the week leading up when perhaps he was trying to make weight. But holy cow, it's not just that he lost. I mean, it wasn't as if it was close. It was a true, no question about it, beat down defeat. 
And I certainly, had I been asked to place a bet, would have lost money on that one. Especially at home. Especially at home. Indeed, I'll go to you, Bo. Look, I, I, you, you work, uh, not work, but you associate with uh, Three Kings Boxing. Um, I wrote an article for them uh, maybe a couple months ago now, uh, talking about Higa and his future. Look, Higa, we've known um, for a minute now that he has had some issues making 112 pounds, um, and the plan for, was for him to move up, if not later this year, early in 20. Um, 19. But in hindsight, uh, was it a mistake for him to, 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 well, obviously it was a mistake, but uh, just your reaction to this. Should they have moved up um, earlier? You know, I think that's going to be the the big question uh, going forward with him is should they have moved up early? And in hindsight to what we saw, for me, I can't say that they that they should have moved up any earlier because the way no one saw this coming the the way he got beat, and if he'd have had some kind of struggles in his last fight, then I mean not just making weight but actual struggles in the fight, then you can make a question. Okay, you kind of struggle a little bit. Maybe he should move up in weight, but he didn't, and there was no signs that that of of struggle. So. That's a tough one. Like anybody that say maybe he should have, I'm not going to argue with. But for me, because I didn't see any type of struggle in his last fight or anything that made me feel like, okay, you know, maybe now's the time from his last fight. And then you look at, like you said, Christopher, you know, um, 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 Rosales, he came in. I, I don't, I think even if he would have made weight, he, he came in ready to, he had a game plan, he executed and he came in ready to fight. And, uh, like Gail said, he just flat out got beat and nobody saw this. So, uh, and like you said, you know, we see this too often of guys um, missing weight and he missed weight by, you know, the two pounds. But what was shocking to me and what I'm kind of glad to see to happen is normally situations like this when guys don't make weight and the, and the belt become vacant, you know, the belt, belt wind up being vacant and he gets another shot at it. Well, Rosales won, 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 won this fight, won the belt. Uh, now the question is, does he could try to rematch to regain his belt or should he just move up? And that's going to be the big question he's going to have to ask himself because you got beat really bad. So do you try to avenge that loss or do you go move up? And mind you, when you move up, everybody's going to be looking at how bad you lost. You could become food at 115 for guys looking at you. Because 115 is not necessarily a light division either. You got Rumbasai, you got uh, uh, um, uh, Kyle Yafai, you got Encajas, you got, you know, Don Nietes. So he's got some decision making to make. But yeah, he lost in such a fashion that, you know, you, you kind of want to see what he's going to be like when he come back. But he should be okay. But um, I'm glad I didn't bet on it either. Um, yeah, uh, shouldn't take too much we shouldn't take um, credit away from Rosales, who, from jump, started out strong. Uh, the bigger guy, the taller guy, uh, forced the pace. Had had Higa fighting defensive and backwards um, from opening bell, uh, was not scared one bit. Um, it also also should be noted that uh, Rosales, who has done um, a lot of sparring, extensive sparring with uh, uh, Roman Gonzalez, and the argument, serious argument, can be made that. Um, that sparring with Choco Latito over the years uh, toughened him up and readied him for uh, a, a fighter in a style like Higa, who who fights very similar, in my opinion, to uh, uh, a young Roman Gonzalez in particular. Um, I'll open it up for the rest of the panel here. I see Scor uh, Scorsese has joined us. Uh, your thoughts, fellas, on, on on this fight? Were you surprised as as I was? Uh, level of disappointment at Higa one. Once again, an example of a fighter um, fell into make weight. The future of Higa. Your thoughts? And this is for everybody else here in the panel, Scorsese, as well as uh, Daniel and Jacob. Uh, I just say real quick, I've I, I listened to a lot of hangouts that have covered this and shows. And going into it, I looked at the ratings and it said 2 and 10. A person I trust when it comes to the smaller weights. Now the, he had these guys rated 2 and 10. So 
uh, for the people that I was listening to that was making excuses, uh, not nobody here. I haven't heard anybody yet, but it's just like um, the shows I was listening to say, well, they lose because they fight each other. He he lost because he fought somebody. Look, two and ten fight a lot in a, in a ton of divisions and don't even get credit for doing it. So don't play that all oh, they lose because they fight each other thing. No, he lost. He got upset. All right. So that's that's just my take on that from people trying to make that excuse. Oh, well, he fought somebody a lot of twos and tens fight. So it's an upset, not just a competitive fight happening. He got dealt with. Nah, I'm 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 just I'm sick of the excuses and um the favoritism on some of the podcasts I go on. That's all I want to say. Mm, mm, mm. Um, Daniel, Jacob, your thoughts. It was surprising at first and <clears throat> to see him. He got lose the lose the belt on the scale because Japan did get a little bit on their high horse when the near situation happened. I saw like some good Japanese fans saying our fighters never wait, wait, our fighters are disciplined. And this guy comes in pretty much couldn't lose the two pounds. It's it was gonna be a case of his body ultimately saying, No, you can't do this anymore. And, and let me interrupt and say, if you reading, paying attention to the parts the week of the fight, uh, you got the real sense that uh, uh, mate, he was having real difficulty getting him down. The initial press conference, I believe, Wednesday, I believe, um, from everything I was reading, uh, he didn't look good physically. He kind of looked out of it. Uh, so you could, you could kind of see this uh, uh, happening. Yeah. You could see that, but then you could see the situation probably happening with what happened with Neary. Neary missed the weight and then wound up just beating the daylights out of Yamanaka once again. Well, in this case, no. This time he got, looked pretty bad. He looked pretty spent in that fight. Now, I give credit credits to, to the opponent. When you spar with Chocolatito Gonzalez, since childhood, and knowing that Charles is a fighter that you have to fight at an intense pace just to spar with him, yeah, he deserves all the credit in that victory. Now, we know, like I said, that the corner, st corner stopped the fight. It wasn't the tenth day TKO. He just corner stopped the fight. They probably saw their guy losing too much. It, was, it, it wasn't looking like he was going to get the knockout needed to turn it around and they probably did him a little bit of a favor because now they actually have to sit down and think it's 115 now something that we definitely have to do because your body just told you you were two pounds over what it would be different like say if he was like a half a pound over or like a third of a pound of where he just wasn't able to edit this was two pounds like i said the same um, same thing i say with lose i'm gonna say with neary is your body outgrew it. That's the whole point. Your body outgrew it. And now you now you have to put into a division that granted your biggest domestic rival has vacated and now in a new way. But you still have, like Bo mentioned, Calify. You still have Run Visai. You still have Estrada. You don't have Quadras for the time being. But and then you have the Arroyo brothers. So it's a pretty stacked division for you to step into. And it's going to be tough to see how to bounce back it because just in the same way, like I said, when I'm going back to Neri, Neri has to rebuild like the confidence he had back, back in among fans. He just going to have to do the same because like it wasn't like a close, a close fight throughout that. That man was getting his ass whipped. And like, luckily, his corner did the right thing and stopped it. Hmm. Um, your thought, your thoughts, Jacob. I <laughs> uh, see Jacob left. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, he'll be back. He's going to say something, Scorsese. Yeah, I, I just just to the Yahoo cover who watch these guys more and may, maybe follow their habits more. These these three pounds and four pounds every now and then seem to make these dudes. You know, get greedy. I, I just mentioned this in the comments. It's like you see, you see Neri, 
Uh, you can sort of look at Chocolatito some. He, you know, he had to come up and wait. And some people say, well, he couldn't make 12 anymore. So, you know, it got a little difficult with him at, at 15. Um, the, the guy here today, you know, missing the weight. I, I'm starting to feel like seeing that, man, you know, it's only three pounds. They get greedy and say, I can be a two-time champion. They'll call me three-time champion. But if they wipe, I just feel like if they wipe these classes out and, and put them six pounds, seven pounds, five pounds, like everybody else, eight, that they'll get where they're supposed to and stop trying to look for that extra accomplishment. Does anybody else sort of feel that way? No, because of body percentage. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, the body, when you're at that size, unfortunately, mm. three pounds matters. Yes. And let me speak as someone who's that size, okay? Um, three pounds, you know, is a lot of your body weight when you weigh 112. That's a lot. You know, that's lunch to somebody who weighs 240. I get it. Mm. But the idea is that every division is supposed to be a, about a 5% difference, 5 to 10% difference. You, you get up to six pounds. It's, it's too big of a swing. And that's why when you see the little smaller weight divisions, the, you know, the margins between them seem really small. I mean, ridiculously small to, especially to somebody that is a, you know, average sized American male. But, and then you, you know, start seeing the seven pounds and the 10 pound differences as you get up, but there's a reason for that. And proportionally, it's really the same difference between each division as you go up. It's like, if you remember your exponent math when you were, you know, in middle school. So there's really no way to broaden out those weight divisions. And, you, and you're not wrong that these guys see that and it's very tempting to jump around, especially when they're younger and they, they can take it on and off. You know, as they get older, they can't be doing that stuff anymore. You know, you're going to naturally settle where your body at 30 says that this is where you're supposed to be as a grown ass man. And there, then there is anything they can do about it. But I, you know, I think we're stuck where we are. But truly, you know, unless you've been down at 110, 112, and that one pound is a struggle, it's hard to imagine. But the struggle is real. And they missing by twos, threes, and I can't remember what Neri done, but psh, come on, man. Neri, Neri, Neri was like five pounds over. <laughs> he tried to get it down. He could only get down to one twenty one. Yeah, that one was, that one was, you know, completely out of bounds. That was nuts. That you know, five pounds at one twenty two. That's ridiculous. But when we're talking. You know, a pound, a pound and a fraction, even even two. You know, yes, your job is to make weight, but yes, your job is much harder to make weight when the margins of error are so small. And it's not that easy to go up in weight, particularly when that's small. Um, I don't yeah. mean this is an indictment against you, Scorsese, but for me, when I hear people make that claim, it's like they look at someone like Pacquiao and think just because he was able to move up all that weight, Means that any other those fighter, any other fighter at say 112, 108, 115, 118 can just move up similarly and be just as effective. No. Nah. Yeah, I, well, I think he should. Just, and let's and let's think. argue about this. You know, arguably and, Pacquiao blew way past his best weight. Way and, past. And they don't put it in the context. Number one, when Pacquiao was a, when Pacquiao first won that world title, he was nineteen years old. Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a he was a young man with a boy's body. Yep. History shows us, on the other hand, that the great fighters at those smaller divisions, they're not as great moving up. Yeah. Two Sharp Johnson, all time great at one hundred and twelve and one fifteen. Once he got to one eighteen, he was too small for the uh, uh, lights of the mark of a Marquez. Tapia, all time great at one fifteen, very good at one eighteen. But once he started moving up to twenty six, he wasn't as good. There's a reason that Michael Carbajal stayed at 108 pounds his entire career. Small I just feel, like, just feel like if you're coming at 14, why in the world ain't you at 15? Like, man, is it? And then to the argument of, you know, they may be too small. 
Um, I can't remember the fight I'm watching the other day. Um, and and size is no factor in this fight. I, I cannot remember this fight. And it's, it's your skills can pay those bills for just one weight class. I, I just feel like man, they see these numbers, and it's tempting to be said I'm three, I'm two, I'm two division, four division, and it's working against. And and he took that whooping because of it. I really believe he did, and it was a nice whooping. Credit to uh, the guy that whooped his tail, man. It was it was fun to watch that. Well, if you, the thing about it is, and especially in the weight class, because it's the differences, like I said. They're small numbers wise, as far as you're looking at it, like from 105, 108, it's easy to be like a two time, three time champion, three different weight classes. It's easier to do it there numerically. You have to look good while doing it, though. And looking back, Pacquiao had the combination of the fact that he had strong speed and he had strong legs and he had the just better hand speed. Yeah. He, he was one of the few fighters that asked. He went up he didn't lose much hand speed yeah it's one thing for a guy with a big frame to move up particularly the one in, in he does and especially in Neri's case um uh, yeah their bodies are telling them to move up in weight and in that instance scorsese you're right they should have moved up and they should have moved up a while ago but we can't be we can't we have to be careful and not make a broad based generalization um in that regard i see jacob is back um, I want his uh, analysis of the Higa fight. And Bo, I want to bring you into this discussion of, in terms of these smaller fighters moving up in weight as well. First, you, Jacob. Yeah, sorry about that. I pushed the wrong button and hung up. Um, yeah, for me, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a buddy that says when you disrespect the sport of boxing, you know, it comes back to haunt you. You know, the boxing gods make it right. And to me, the biggest disrespect to not only boxing, but your opponent is to not make weight. It was part of your job, you know. Um, it's probably my biggest pet peeve in, in boxing. Um, so, you know, he didn't make weight. Um, to Daniel's earlier point, you know, it's kind of weird. You know, you, uh, the Japanese um, are known to be, at least in my opinion, very disciplined, um, very professional people. And it's kind of weird that, you know, we had that Neary fight and then this this happens and, you know, he wasn't able to make weight, um, which is the first time in a long time that I can remember a, a Japanese fighter not making weight. Um, but, I mean, you know, he, he, he lost. I mean, the corner did stop it. You know, it wasn't like a complete knockout, but he was losing the fight pretty handily. Uh, he, he looked terrible in the fight. So, again, it's kind of justice uh without having like a court of law um i'll I go to you uh bo bring into this discussion uh the contrast of a fighter say at middleweight light heavyweight welterweight moving up uh versus uh a fighter at straw weight junior flyweight flyweight junior bantamweight bantamweight should there be a comparison there <sighs> You know, I think um, in the overall texture, I, I can understand people trying to make that comparison, but no, there shouldn't be a comparison because the reality is be from 108 to about 118, uh, and I think somebody said it earlier, that weight is the majority of not just day body weight, but that one pound, sometimes that half a pound can be the difference between them having energy to go 12 whole rounds of them running out of energy around the sixth round uh, versus when you get up in the, the, the higher weight divisions, like um, from 147 to 154 is um, like seven, almost like I think 147, 154 is seven pounds, 154 to 160 is only six pounds and so forth and so on. Uh, that's a different body makeup because you start moving up in that weight, your body gets bigger, your body gets stronger. You punch a hell of a lot harder. Uh, but when you start looking at the uh, the lower weight divisions, it's just the way that the, the, the makeup of your body is. Uh, you guys was talking about Michael Carbajal. I remember uh, Jeff Chandler was another guy who was around 118. And um, you can see as he started moving up, how he started having some issues. So it shouldn't be – I can see people want to make that comparison, but it's kind of hard to because when, you, when you're looking at 112, just picture 112 and picture 115. To us, it's not that big of a deal. But – 
long, exceptionally long, long time ago when I was 112 and I got to 115, that that jump, that that three pounds and then trying to lose that three pounds or trying to trying to go a pound or half a pound in between there. <laughs> that makes a hell of a difference because I was wrestling. That makes a hell of a difference between me being able to get that burst of energy for that next minute or being dead within the next 30 seconds. So I feel like you can't really make that comparison when you're when you're talking about that low, because that's not a lot of body. That's this is not a that's most of your body weight when you're talking about that. Perfect example historically, <laughs> Jeff Fennick. 18, 22, even 26. He was powering over guys uh, because he was so much physically stronger than anybody in those divisions. Uh, got to the point where 18, a lot of folks arguing during his title defenses at 118, he really didn't make the way. He just jumped on the scale and jumped but off. Um, mm -hmm. Cheating, cheating, cheating um, scale wise. But look at what happened when he uh, fought a healthy, not sick Azuma Nelson in his second fight and how Nelson toyed with him and beat him up. And then subsequently he moves up to 35 and you saw what Philip Holiday did to him, blasting him out in two rounds. I'm just saying, uh, 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 going back to you, Scorsese, I hear your point, but there's a limit. There's a limit. I can understand the argument about they're weighing over and they should move up, but just to automatically go up just because or to set legacy, you can't always do that with those smaller guys. You just can't. Um, let's let's move on to uh, uh, other fights. Listen, this uh, Higa fight was on the undercard of uh, Ryota, Ryota Murata uh, making the first defense of his WBA middleweight title um, shown live here in the States um, early Sunday morning. Uh, fought a nine to script opponent by the Italian, Italian guy by the name of uh, going to try to pronounce his name correctly here. Um, Blanda Mira, easy work for uh, uh, Murata. Uh, took him out in eighth round, stopped him with overhand right by after basically wearing him down from round two to seven. Bob Aram, I'm going to the panel here, anybody can respond. Bob Aram has big plans for Murata to the point where I'm hearing that he may try to entice Triple G to come to Japan to fight Murata in a big money showdown. Thoughts on Murata? Thoughts on his potential, thoughts on his on his standing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the middleweight division, especially given what we've been hearing about Triple G and his opponent being finalized, as well as the news with Canelo. And this is just for anybody who wants to respond. He's getting there in the fringe. Like, he looked good in that fight. Nice overhand right, but that's been his pedigree. He's, he's a rarity in Japan, you have to remember. He's a Japanese fighter in that type of weight class. You don't normally see them. Now, right, and which is pretty interesting in Japan because they actually have a pretty de uh, decent guy. I forgot the guy's name, but he's a heavyweight. Pretty decent prospect in Japan. The thing, though, is he still he has a murderous row ahead of him with the WBA because, honestly, if you're going to want to get Triple G in fear of the WBA, Go through Jacobs. Go through Danny Jacobs. And then there's the fact that you can you still have the Endeavorchenko. You have Jamal Charlo there. You have to count Canelo in. And there's interesting fights going in here and there. You still can you can count Lemieux in still. You can you have to count Spike O'Sullivan, Billy Joe Saunders. I don't count Lemieux, but go ahead. I have to count him <laughs> in a little bit. I have to count I'm him. Sorry, I don't. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, but I don't blame you for not counting them. But the main thing is, though, is that's he's, he, there's a pretty filled class of middleweight right now that, <laughs> particularly when I, when you look at J Jacobs and Jamal, because obviously Danny Jacobs can make the claim that he should have he should have been the guy to fought Golovkin in September rather than Canelo. Mm. Even, there's an honest case there for it. And we know Jamal. Jamal's been the mandatory for how long now? A few, almost a year. So he's got a little bit to wait as far as the big money showdown in Japan. A, 
it it depends on the situation because remember the the whole thing with Saunders was he wanted to fight in Kazakhstan because they had the World Expo there. If if Golovkin sticks around, let's say if he sticks around to twenty twenty, then I could see a big fight in Japan because it'll be close then to the Tokyo Olympics. Yeah. And though and that Japanese crowd will be rabid at that point. I just don't get how you let Danny Jacobs and uh, Matt Selecki, I can't pronounce the last name, fight for the mandatory spot, and and you have the you know that underling belt that you've been having. I, I mean Bob can talk about I want this and I want that, but bro, like <laughs> what? Like, like this this supposed to be your shot, and they finna fight in a few weeks for it. So I I kind of don't get this promotion to move. I don't think Charlo is the mandatory just yet. I think uh, the Centeno fight will set that out, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that's my main thing. I want to see more, but when you when I see promoters, I hear you talking, but your guy already in position, and the WBA ain't been petitioned to make him the mandatory. I I hear you, but you know, I just don't believe you. Now I'll bring Jacob, uh, Gail, and Bo into this discussion. Um, fight aside with uh, uh, Blonda, uh, the Italian guy. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. I'll butcher it. Look, it was a showcase bout. He knew he, he was going to win, and he won by stoppage. But let's talk future here, Murata. Your thoughts? Um, I mean, for me, I mean, again, like Daniel said, there's a lot of people in the mix there, uh, notwithstanding Lemieux, <laughs> uh, as to your point. But, uh, I mean, he's, he's got enough – I think he has enough of a competitive um, not only spirit but skills that he can, uh, you know, make some good fights in there. I don't know that he's going to win all those tougher fights. Again, this, this fight was a showcase fight. So, you know, you're supposed to look good in those fights. But once you step up your competition to like a Jacobs or – a Charlo, uh, I don't know if he's going to have as much success. So, um, But again, the, I think the main thing is, is that I don't know that he's going to get uh, Triple G or entice them unless they have some big money because based on what happened today, or I'm sorry, this week, and you know they're going to be looking for that, that rematch fight after his, his other fight. So... That's where the money's going to be. So they'd have to have a pretty deep pockets to be able to entice them, in my opinion. Well, and in the middleweight division, the clock is ticking on Golovkin. It just is. He is not going to be able to face every single guy in the lineup before he either retires or consolidates the division. You know, I, we really have to look toward the end of next year. Can he bag fights with? Saunders with Murata with Jacobs if he becomes the mandatory Derevchenko Ludovella is going to keep beating the drum on that one and there's still questions about that um, given his next fight you know he's only going to be able to fit so many of those in he he'd like to fight three or four times a year that that's what he says I have no reason not to believe that but at his level the problem that he's always had is still there. It's the risk versus reward ratio. For example, Spike Sullivan, who was offered the fight that eventually has now gone to Vanis Martirosian, which we'll be talking about, O'Sullivan got offered the fight and turned it down because when it went from being an HBO pay-per-view to a standard HBO broadcast, the budget dropped, so the purse dropped. And O'Sullivan wants more money. If he's going to get a beatdown, he wants a payday. That's been the problem with Golovkin, is there isn't enough of, of purse money to make the risk versus reward ratio good enough for these guys to say, well, you know, I'm likely to you know, get a beatdown or a loss or a real test, but if I get paid enough, you know, well, that money takes away quite a bit of the pain and the loss on the record. So you have a limited, you know, limited options where that's concerned. That's always going to be a problem. And unfortunately, I'm not sure Murata is going to come along fast enough. The Japanese public 
you know, the boxing fans in Japan who are, are wonderful fans are so excited to have a guy in one of the bigger weight divisions that's successful. You know, he, it's, he's a very rare bird in Japan being a middleweight, but they can only push him along so far. I just don't see him being ready. He had a showcase fight. He did fine. He did what he needed to do. I didn't think he looked particularly sharp. Um, he got the job done. I'm not sure I have a, a very high praise for the way he went about it. This guy was, you know, he might as well have been facing a, you know, punching bag. I mean, that the only the only asset Bindamura had was the ability to move in, jab, and clinch to avoid punishment but he could only do that for so long and it made for not the most interesting fight in the world short enough you now sunday morning any port in a storm there you go but i think the public needs to be a tiny bit more patient with murata your thoughts on you, this book you, oh go ahead i'm you sorry can you can insert punching bag we can now use the word angulo well well, uh, well i, I well, prefer salka but that's another story well, at least, at least number one, this guy can see, unlike um, um, Angulo. Uh, and, and number two, in terms of Rod Salka, I'm not, not going to talk about uh, much about that, but um, he got what he was asking for, given the response he wore. Uh, your thoughts, Bo? He got what he's asked for. He got what he deserved. He got what he needed. Word. Uh, <laughs> but as far as Murata goes, here's the thing, and I'm going to go to a point that Jake was made, is they actually feel, from a money standpoint, that they can accommodate Gennady Golovkin. Uh, he is a huge, huge attraction over in his home country of Japan. Um, so they feel like, okay, you know, if if it's money, we can we can provide you with the money. We can even put you in a stadium that has about sixty thousand people, and they'll come out to, to go. But the problem <laughs> with that is, and um, one of the one of the uh, uh, biggest issue is that. Will it be? Uh, yeah, it'll be big over in Japan, but I wasn't impressed by Murata either. I'm with Gil on that. This was a showcase fight. Um, I need to see him uh, some of the 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 higher upper uh, upper echelon guys. And one of the things that Golovkin's run into, it's like okay, you have the opponents. Before you didn't have the before you didn't have the opponents, and every and whoever you was going to fight won a lot of money. Okay, now you got the opponents, and now the money isn't there. To accommodate the opponent um for example you you used uh one example i'm gonna get another example which is uh devin yank uh uh, uh devin yank devin yanchenko when hbo themselves have said they don't have enough money to pay both golovkin and devin Chenko for this fight so somebody's gonna come up short so that's the reason why if that they're there that's a fight that yeah we, you, we could probably make but we don't have enough money to accommodate either one of these guys because, like you said, they went from an HBO pay per view to just a regular showing. Well, and, and, and in part, they see that as a more important fight. And mm -hmm. Tom Loeffler made it pretty clear he didn't think anybody could do that matchup justice in exactly. what turned out to be three weeks, money it, aside. You know, exactly. so that was another complicating factor. I mean, let's face it, that situation has been one of a kind in all the wrong ways. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I was just. And you're right, and I was given that as the money aspect of it. But uh, look, Murata, can he bring can he bring the money? They feel they can bring the money. So if it's a if it's about money, hey, we feel we can bring you the money. But the bigger problem is that with the with the news with our Alvarez, you might still get the fight we want to see in September, which is more money than any other fights we're talking about right now. So. Golovkin and his team is trying to position themselves to where, yeah, we keep our guy busy, but at the same time, we're still in the hunt to, to, to have this fight later on if it's going to happen this year. And I think Golovkin and his team is looking at the, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at that acceleration light on your career as it starts getting closer to him. Golovkin is, is, is mid, what, 34, 35, going on 36. So right about now, it has to make sense for them from a money standpoint because they're looking at, I don't know if they make it to 2020, 2019 might be it for him. So uh, a lot of these fights, 
they're going to need time because you're going to have to have them. You're going to need the money to build them. So yeah, Murata might have a case, but at the end of the day, the guy he fought was was a fight that just made you look good. You can't fight that kind of guy and convince me you're ready for Golovkin. No, I'm sorry. That's not going to sell for me. Now, it might do big over in Japan, but it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't do nothing for Golovkin because what I saw doesn't impress me to make me think he has a chance with Golovkin. I don't think he has a chance with, with Charlo, Jacobs, you know, or, or, or Andrade, hell, Rob Brand even. I don't, I don't know if you have a chance with them guys. So I just need to see more from them. And, uh, you know, you know, bless your heart, Daniel, for <laughs> throwing in uh, David Lemieux. But Jesus, fuck, I don't want to see that do it again. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Um, let's just go ahead and go into in terms of the news. Uh, combine two stories into one here uh, that went that came down today. Uh, Canelo Alvarez getting kind of a pro uh, a, a year suspension, proactive, reduced to six, six months. months. Six yeah. months. Gennady Golovkin uh, uh, finally finally getting opponent an opponent. Uh, for May 5, turns out to be Veins, um, uh, Vonis Monterose, and going to combine these two stories here. I'm looking at this. Number one, I'm, I'm side-eyeing um, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Okay, you uh, suspended him, but you suspended him just in time for September, which everybody knows is a big pay-per-view month. Glovkin, he gets his opponent against a smaller guy uh, with no power uh, that he should beat, I'll go to you, Scorsese, first. Let's just face. Let's just call this what it is. This is a setup for Golovkin and Canelo to fight in September. I don't think they're gonna fight in September. The knee of Canelo, the surgery he had. They come out and say, "Oh, he just had cosmetic surgery." No, Canelo says, "I really had a surgery." Um, I think he holds enough weight to say, "I'll fight. I do what I want to do in September, and then I'll see you when I see you when you're a year older." And maybe when you got a Billy Joe Saunders belt or just struggle with Billy Joe Saunders, who knows? So I'm, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, you know, of course, Nevada played this move. They're going to let him make some money somehow. And I heard he was threatening not to, not to fight in the state no more if they wanted to play hardball. So, you know, you, you know, he, 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 he grease him up, so him let him slide. So, uh, Canelo, uh, He'll be back in September, but I don't think Triple G gonna be the opponent. I think uh, May 2019. Well, who are you gonna fight then? It uh, sometimes people don't seem to care, including himself. So uh, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's always something with Canelo. Hell, he may bring Vinus out and say I could do just as good as Canelo, uh, just as good as Triple G did. It, hell, he fought Liam Smith, fought James Kirkland. Shh. I don't put it past him, you know. He and he Con. does. He, there you go. He has that built-in excuse. Oh to God, say, no. my knee, my knee, and I've been out. So I don't think they're fighting in September. I I couldn't agree with you more. Canelo is going to want to have a tune-up fight, and so the, he'll. Both of the gentlemen will fight in September. Golovkin will fight in September. Canelo will fight in September. They will not fight each other in September. It really is the ideal time uh, for Golovkin to go after Saunders. If they can make that fight happen, he'll salvage his year. That's, that's truly the meaningful fight for him. The Canelo rematch is not the meaningful fight for him. That's the money fight for him. But from a, from a record and a legacy point of view, he's never made a secret for all of the years that he has been fighting primarily based in the United States. He wants to unify the division. And to his credit, that has always been his focus. He mentions it at every single news conference. He answers every single question about it the same way. So he's never changed. He can do that, assuming that Saunders gets through his fight with Martin Murray in June. They could easily set a later September fight for the two of them. Let Canelo have the earlier Mexican Independence Day date. You know, he he is the along with Joshua, the one guy who can generate big money. Las Vegas community and the fans do not care who Canelo faces on September 16th. 
they 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 bought tickets and sold the place out when he faced Chavez Jr. for you know for Christ's sake. It does not matter who it is. I you forgot know? about that one. Think about it. It doesn't. But it it is. It was crazy making to see that arena, that beautiful huge arena filled, and we knew what was going to happen. It did happen, and they bought the tickets anyway. So. There's plenty of talent in the middle ranges of the middleweight division who would love big money. You know, there the risk versus reward ratio is is fantastic. Who wouldn't take a fight with that kind of a payday and with that kind of visibility? Yeah. You no know, reward. anybody, anybody uh, I would say your opponent choices are anyone, anyone other than saunders golovkin or jacobs i say everyone else is probably fair game playing nope. devil's advocate gail uh excuse me score says it playing oh, devil's yeah. advocate uh one you're not concerned about what the ibf um hinted at possibly stripping uh triple g if he goes on with this fight a b uh given that golovkin has gone through this career throughout the majority of his career not really getting the super big payday um you don't think he will try to wait out canelo uh for a fight in september or whatever instead of going another route with saunders for the money you know and that is that's that's the million dollar question or a several million dollar question literally and you know i, I would normally say a fighter is always going to go for the money and they have to, in their, in their own self-interest, they have to. Golovkin has never been quite as much about the big money. He lives very frugally. He isn't a guy who, you know, spends a lot on the niceties of life. I, I think he's driven the same black BMW modest sedan it's since I can remember. You know, that's the kind of lifestyle. I imagine that when he is done boxing, he's going to quietly retire, uh, end up, you know, living partially in the United States, somewhat anonymously and partially in Kazakhstan being some kind of a cultural or athletic, athletic ambassador, who the hell knows. I just don't think he's quite as driven by the money. You know, a couple of million dollars versus 10 million, you know, all of us are thinking you'd be crazy not to take that kind of money but once you've got enough to live on there are people in this world who say i'm fine i've got enough i've managed my money well yeah. and i would rather not risk my legacy over this oh. you're right to me ludabella ibf and derevinchenko are a very interesting wild card in all this thing but Debella and Tom Waffler have a very good relationship. They talk freely with each other. Debella's a practical guy. We'll see what happens. You know, there are a lot of arrangements that can be made and step aside money and creative thinking. And I, I think there's going to be some creative thinking going on. Uh, before I go to uh, Bo, Daniel, and Jacob, you just want to say something quickly, Scorsese? Yeah, we was asking who the opponent was going to be. I think we all said the name at least once here tonight. Dave Lemieux. That's oh, it. Stop. Stop. It. Oh. Yeah, that's it, bro. <laughs> although, although that's very possible. You know, they are both under the Golden Boy banner. Lemieux does sell tickets. I know what you guys all think about him. You know, what's, what's interesting about Lemieux is you never know which version of him is going to show up. Is it the version that, you know, clocked Curtis Stevens? Or is it the version that got the beat down from Saunders? Who knows? The problem with that is he needs a uh, Curtis Stevens to show up to bring that version out. <laughs> well, that certainly helps quite a bit. Yeah, no question but, about yeah. it. Look, but, look that, that realistically, they've been trying to make that fight and pass it off as something for. And Golden Boy still ain't took their hands off of him. He got a fight coming up above the border soon. That, like, they so not, that is that is absolutely gonna, true. No, you're correct about that. It's gonna be Gabriel's auto watch. Oh my God! I'm shutting my mic off. <laughs> uh, uh, Bo and Daniel, your thoughts on all this? Well, you know, here's the thing. Until 
when I saw the uh, so uh, Canelo Alvarez having the, uh, the 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 knee surgery and all that, I it did give me cause to pause. Like, okay, I think you know he might not fight in September, or there could definitely be some doubt there in September for the fight to take place because once you have your knee tampered with and messed on and uh and you know carnello is my opinion is a full-fledged diva <clears throat> i don't see him unless that knee is 100 percent, or unless there really wasn't nothing wrong with it did you said this i don't see him going into such a dangerous fight with a guy like golovkin without knowing if this knee is going to hold up so when i first saw that that gave me called the pause but uh, I also also believe that Golovkin, in the, you know, is the reason why they're they're taking a fight with Ivanish Monarosian, is in and and waiting to see what the decision is going to be. And we just found out, which in my opinion is the joke of a fucking decision. But <laughs> to see if Canelo is going to make that move, can they still get that fight? I hear what Gail is saying that Canelo, I mean, that Golovkin isn't somebody who is big all about money. But the reason why that gives me cause to pause because he could have fought Saunders last year for that belt, but Paul didn't because of Oscar them dangling the Carnello uh, carrot above him. So he he might not be moved by money, but there's something there about this Alvarez fight, period, that has always been looming over them that they have been wanting, whether it's the money, whether it's Car uh, Car Carnello's name, I don't know what. But it is something that is the reason why that they've always kind of that, that carrot been dangled in front of them. They've kind of always reached for it to, to see, man, am I going to finally get it? Am I going to finally get it? What's going on? Um, but um, when you look at it, if they don't fight, then it is then that's when it gets interesting because if they don't fight, do Golovkin see if there's money with uh, over in Japan with fighting that guy uh, um, or Miriata? Does he try to make, like you said, the wild card Dervinchenko? And listen, I like Lou DiBella, but Lou DiBella is one of those promoters that's all bark and no bite. He's not a power. He's not what I would call a power play promoter. So I do agree that there is some type of step aside or some type of backdoor deal that you can make with Lou DiBella. He's not someone that starts talking and things get to moving, you know. So, and I and I like him, but that Dervinchenko fight, I, I do agree with Gail. There'll be some movement there. So, except, these, you know, over the summer is going to be very interesting to see some of the moves that's going to be played out because I can see Carnello not fighting Golovkin and taking a light touch to see how the knee is, but then having Golovkin fight on the undercard to, uh, in, in a fight or vice versa. So it's going to be interesting to see, but uh, I know we want to see Golovkin versus Carnello Alvarez, but with that, I just – if I'm Canelo Alvarez and I had my knee severely scoped on, and I know people are going to say, "Oh, it's just April," let me tell you something. I don't it it, it I don't care who you are. When you've actually had your knee worked on, you know it 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 could be February. You're not going to test that knee in such a high profile, intense matchup with a guy like Golovkin before you make sure that it's going to hold up to the punishment that's going to be needed. And you don't know if he could tweak it again in training camp or whatever the case may be. So I pretty much agree with, with I don't, I'm not too positive the fight's going to happen if this is really what's happening with Carnelo Lee. So it's, like I said, the summer is going to be really interesting, interesting for me. And if Gennady Golovkin fights David Lemieux, then another Oscar De La Hoya guy, which is what they tried to get with Spike O'Sullivan, then there again, I hear what you're saying, Gail, but there's something there that with Oscar dangling that carrot over them, because here it is again, you, you know, you had O'Sullivan, but he turned it down. And then you're talking about David Lemieux in September. Nah, and I, I, I don't want to see it. I just, I don't want to see it. I know he sells, but he's already lost Golovkin once. And we saw him get beat by Billy Joe Saunders. Can you really sell that a second time? No. Oh, I, I don't think that's going to, I don't think Lemieux, you're not saying Golovkin and Lemieux, are you? No, it's, it's oh, Canelo. Okay. Is oh, liking. Canelo and Lemieux. Canelo. Yeah. That's, I don't, that's. See, they I both don't know share, if I would even want to see that. The same, well, they both share the same promoter. You know, everybody gets to hang on to the money. They don't have to play with anybody else. And that's probably the kind of, you know, that's probably what Lemieux deserves is to be cannon fodder. And and he will put butts in the seats. 
you know, again. Now, that would be a good in-house fight. Canelo is the A, you know, when you've got Canelo as the A side, yeah. the B side, frankly, doesn't matter all that much from a money standpoint. Now, I, will, I do agree that that would be a very good in-house fight that they could make and uh, uh, to the point of, hey, they was able to sell us him and Chavez, you know, Gail's boyfriend, Chavez Jr. They was able to sell us that. <laughs> so, maybe hey, they hey, hey, I'm not a cradle off. robber. <laughs> Holy shit. No, 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 no. You. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, uh, shout out to Wingy Boxing. Uh, if you listened to the podcast last week, iTunes, SoundCloud, um, yes, that was his voice uh, with the opening. Um, he's listening to the show live. Um, as first off, um, second before I go to Daniel and Jacob, while we're talking about this with Canelo and Triple G, um, I would like to uh, note um, the excellent trolling that uh, uh, Jordan Brand, uh, Canelo, and especially Abel Sanchez did with that commercial that dropped this week with Sanchez sitting there with the plate of beef. <laughs> I've just had to point that out. That was hilarious, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, Sanchez no could barely keep a straight face. Did you notice he could yeah. barely? Yeah, the end they had they had on that no draw. I thought that oh, was exactly. Oh, God. I thought that was. <laughs> he was enjoying was, a monster yeah. plate of steak and eggs. I swear they shot that at the restaurant that's right behind the summit. There's a Mexican joint there, and Big Bear. He he. He uh, is a patron of, a very regular patron. Yeah, absolutely hilarious. That was that was good fun yesterday. World, world, Abel Sanchez is a world-class trash talker. He, he is, he's been Golovkin's bag man for that. You know, Golovkin doesn't have to light it up. He can let Abel do it for him. Daniel and Jacob, your thoughts on all this? Oh, where to begin? Where to begin? Uh, we'll, we'll start with the Canelo thing first. First of all, shout out to Wingy Boxing, too. Uh, this was expected. The Nevada State Athletic Commission does play favorites. And to put in the six-month suspension and then start retroactively the suspension from the first test, you knew what they were doing. You knew they were leaving this door open for a possible five fight with Golovkin in September, or just a fight in Canelo in general September. But here's the whole thing. I think all the boys that said I'm, I'm fighting in September with Canelo, they don't have to do it in Vegas. If it's September and they're going to do a light touch, they could take the fight to Texas and just have Canelo build up more of this fan base there in Texas, I guess like I said, maybe they, they get a Spike O'Sullivan. Maybe they get somebody else to do it. If it's that's the case, if it involves his knee, if his knee is that serious, because, yes, it's very true. Once you get a major body part taken out, it doesn't matter if it's bone chips, if you just leave free enough liquid, that takes time to heal. You're not going to be at 100% for a while. That's the one thing. We already need, like, they're going to free it up. because And the only fight that probably Canelo you want to do in September, considering the money, is Golovkin. So the so the Nevada State Athletic Commission is saying, saying, like, okay, we're going to free this up, and we're going to want to see you with Golovkin. The Golovkin side of the situation, Triple G side to it, I'll put it, I'll, I'll put it as bluntly as possible. If you are legitimately about on the belts, why in God's name would you risk messing with the one sanctioning body that actually tends to follow their rules and they're putting a bum ass fight with Bonus Monerosian? Yes, I called it a bum ass fight. That's what it is. Because the, the IBF could easily say, you know what? No. We are the IBF. We actually follow our rules. You're stripped. And oh, by the way, yeah, Luther Bell is not a is not a power player, but guess what? His boss Al Heyman is. And Al Heyman might want to say, you know what? I want to give Jamal a belt. So the Bella, do the thing you need to do. 
have Triple G stripped, and then we can have Demerchenko and Jamal fight for the IBF belt. Because as an IBF belt holder before, Jamal does have that luxury to do so. So that's a very, very big wild card, and that throws the whole thing about Golovkin into fray. And you can't say all the belts because then that throws a Saunders fight out of the way. Well, Saunders would throw things out of the way. Billy Ho is Billy Ho until Billy Ho signs the paper. So there's that aspect to it, and it it does kind of leave a bad taste in my mouth. When this is the fight where you're this is the fight that lets you tie Hopkins for most title defenses at middleweight. And you couldn't even just swallow your pride a little bit, say, okay, we're not gonna fight May 5th. We'll fight in June, we'll fight July, but we'll do Debachenko. You're giving me Vanis Mount Erosion. We know it's gonna happen. We know it's gonna happen in that fight. It'll probably worse than the Mark and Tony Ruba fight. But I think to me, all the roads are gonna lead to possibly them fighting in September. Barring any major issues from Canelo's knee. If it does turn out to be something really, really drastic, yeah, then yeah, they're not gonna fight until next May. But if it's something minor, and if Canelo does the right rehab, which he has the means to, yeah, they'll they'll probably fight, they'll probably definitely fight again in September because like Bo said, there's something about the Canelo fight that makes Golovkin's and his team more like I mean, his team more likely focus on it. Because remember, the, that person is not just going to Golovkin; it's going to Loeffler, it's going to K2, it's going to Abel Sanchez. So all of that team is looking at that big money. You're One of the main re- oh, I'm sorry, right. I thought you were finished. Go ahead. No, not yet. That, that's it. It's main reason why you. They're not even fighting in Vegas. They're fighting in a sub-hub center, which as a great of a venue as it is, logistically, it's going to be less expensive than T-Mobile Arena. Your thoughts on all this, Jacob? Um, so first, I'll go with Canelo first. Uh, yeah, that whole thing is a sham in the sense that, you know, I know it's a first offense, but it, it was two separate times that he got popped. Uh, they're not, you know, they have a chance to make an example out of a popular fighter, and they didn't, they didn't do that, they didn't take that chance. And this whole retroactive thing, like, I, I always thought that's just a bunch of bullshit. But you know, well, you know, we'll see if he's gonna fight. You know, with this this knee thing, and um, I agree with. Uh, I can't remember who said it. I don't know if it was Bo or whatever, but uh, you, you know, maybe it's Scorsese. But Canelo's gonna do what he what he's gonna do. I mean, he knows that he's golden boys. They're going to cater to him. I mean, the guy barely fights twice a year as it is, you know, only on certain dates. But, I mean, he doesn't, you know, if he's not going to be forced into doing anything, as you saw with, um, you know, the WBC and him not wanting to pay the sanctioning fees and tell them to go fuck themselves. And, you know, just he, he's, a, he's a diva, in, in my opinion. Um, for, the, uh, for the Golovkin thing, I am very, 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 very disappointed in this this uh, modern erosion fight. Um, I mean, it's it's a like Daniel said, it's a it's a bum fight. It's a sham fight. You he's going to get stripped of the IBF belt. I think I think it's almost a for sure thing. So I don't understand why his team didn't just like why do you have to fight on the fifth like i i just i don't understand that part you know you you were been chasing around canelo and now you're not fighting as many times per year and you know you could have moved that date you know a couple months if you know if that i mean he stays in shape pretty much all the time he doesn't dip up and up and down in weight so i i just don't know why they they can't move the fight do a better promotion um you know and then he can get a better opponent and and i don't know why he they won't fight his mandatory like that part doesn't seem i know you're preparing for canelo but i mean you should be prepared at all times to face face anybody so 
you know, that, that part is very disappointing to me because, yes, I know he talks about all the belts, but I, that went out the window for me um, as it being serious when he, didn't, when he took the Canelo fight over the Saunders fight because the Saunders fight would have gave him all the belts. Um, the Canelo fight is giving him money. And I know that we're saying, or it was said before, that he's maybe not as motivated as some by money. I think that he is. Otherwise, he wouldn't be ch chasing Canelo. Like, again, he was fighting three to four times a year, and now he's fighting, you know, now he's like Canelo, where he's, he's waiting for him and, and going to fight like twice a year, um, you know, maybe three at the most. But, you know, to me, he's, he's looking for – he's getting older. He's probably looking to get as much money as possible so that when he does cash out, he doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to work or, you know, do these other things like, you know, open up a gym or, uh, I don't know, a fucking car dealership or whatever, the, you know, these guys do or, you know, have to come back to boxing because, you know, he ran out of money. So he's, he's smart to, to live, you know, frugally, but uh, also, you know, make some good paydays and then, you know, be able to walk away into the sunset. So, um, be it as it may though, I will be there <laughs> live. I got my tickets today. Um, I'm more, I'm hoping that, uh, Cecilia Brackis is, is going to be on that card. Uh, and I would get to see her live. So, uh, that'll probably be the, the most exciting thing for me of that fight than the main event. But, um, uh, funny thing is that uh, Spike O'Sullivan is actually fighting, on that Friday, the night before. So there's going to be back-to-back -back events at the StubHub, which I'm going to both. It'll be Friday, the Golden Boy card with, uh, what's his face, the young kid. And then... Brian, uh, Brian Garcia. Garcia. Yeah. And then um, it'll be, you know, the Triple G card on our fight on the Saturday. So Yeah, we could just sleep in the parking lot, Jacob. That's... You know, we'll, just well I live down this... I live, like, Last year, you are pretty away, close. So. Well, I'll be sleeping on your living room floor then. <laughs> yeah, they... Come got on over. Gold, Golden Boy and, you know, somewhat of a troll move, scheduled their original Vegas undercard for the night before on Friday night, May 4th. Very, very, very smart. Now, uh, K2, Loeffler, has said that they're adding... As, mu as many bleacher seats and as much standing room as they can because they'd like to break the venue attendance record, which Golovkin set against Rubio several years ago, which was, Jacob, I'd have to look it up, but it was darn 9, close. 000, yeah, 9, it was darn like close 9, to 10. Yeah, they want to break that record, and, and I think they will. You know, there isn't a whole lot of opportunity to see somebody at this level of the sport that close, the, you know, the venue is, I'd watch it, you know, virtually anything there. Honestly, I think I'd watch amateurs there. It's just such a pleasure to be there. And the tickets weren't outrageously expensive. You know, they were priced very fairly. Loeffler has said he wanted to have Brackus on the undercard and Chocolatito is available in theory. Now, what's very interesting is there is discussion that he's going to fight at 122. That I'd like to see. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, dear uh -huh. God, no. Dear oh, God, yeah. No. That, that whoa, is. Whoa, whoa. Did you say Chocolatito's going to fight at 122? That's, that's the word on the curb that he intends to campaign at 122. I'm. That's a head shaker. That's really. Now, I, I heard you mention something about. The most beautiful woman in all of combat sports, Miss <laughs> Brockus. And this would be her first fight in the United States in a long time coming. So uh, that would be a delight. And that's a great place with the excitement of a filled arena to introduce her to American boxing fans. I think that Jacob will agree with me, the Southern California fans will embrace her and be extremely excited to see her there. That That's a smart move to add her to the card. And honestly, below that, I don't think anyone cares. Yeah, so um, just as an FYI, so actually Cecilia Brackus did respond to our tweet because me and Gail were going back and forth because I, I did see that Roman Choc Chocolatito was scheduled on that card. And I'm going, I'm on box rec right now and it's showing he's fighting Pedro Guevara. Um, so uh, at super flyweight, 
It's what it's showing, pending, obviously, approval. And then Cecilia Brackus is on there with a two be announced. So there's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. So that looks good. So those are going to be your two. Those are going to be your two undercard TV fighters. And, you know, they'll throw a few local folks on. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the guys under Loeffler's 360 promotions banner are added uh, just to fill out the card. And, and that's a good opportunity for them. Ah, indeed, indeed. So I didn't, I didn't even know those updates about Chocolatito and uh, Cecilia Brackett. So uh, uh, good looking out to both of you, uh, Gail and Jacob. Uh, next story here: um, news regarding Marky Garcia. I go to you on. For, I go to you, Bo, uh, because I saw this over at, at Three Kings, Three Kings Boxing. Looks like Garcia has uh, told the IBF uh, what he plans to do, his future plans. Uh, looks like he's going to give up the belt and move back down to 135. If so, I like this move. 35 is where he should be right now, Bo. Yeah, I like this move myself, and this is the reason why. Was I have um, it? Although there are some good fights for him at 140. Let's not make no mistake. 140 is wide open. There's some good fights for him. But in my honest opinion, I would have held uh, this against Mikey for leaving the division at 135 with a lot of food on the plate. And I mean, good food. Yeah. There are good fights at 140. Uh, you know, you got, uh, you know, Regis Progre, you know, you got the relic, uh, 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 you know, I mean, Relky, uh, yeah, heck even Flanagan, but there's better food for you when, when we're talking Robert Easton, even Beltron, the winner of Lanades versus, Lomachenko, there's better food for you down there that is more legacy building, in my opinion, at 135 than at 140. Okay, you go to 140 and you know you beat Sergey Lipping up. Yeah, good job. You beat Terry Flanagan. Good job. You even beat Relke. Good job. But you beat, but you fight, but you beat a Robert Easton Jr. Okay, you fight a Ray Beltron. Hey, you even take the winner of Lenardes and Lomachenko. Uh, the Robert Easter winner of Lionel Lomachenko, those, in my opinion, can go towards your legacy as legitimizing you as a, a, a top dude in the sport, you know. So I like this move. Um, I'm glad he went. I'm glad he went back down. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that he does fight uh, Robert Easter Jr., revisit that fight because that's a lot of money. And then the fights down there at that 135 can bring him a lot of money. Like I say. Uh, the winner of Lenares and Lomachenko can bring him a lot of money. Robert Easton Jr. can definitely bring him a lot of money, you know. So um, it's good to see him make this move. And I, I really would have held this against. I mean, I understand that move to 140 because he, he went for a belt. But I kind of would have held this against him because just when that division was heating up, you bounced. And uh, it was just I felt the same way about Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao would jump into a division, fight for the WBO belt when he fought uh, David Diaz from Chicago. And instead of fighting at that time, I think the man of the division at that time was um, it wasn't Too Sharp Johnson. Oh, what was his name? I can't remember the guy's name, but he he he. Oh, Nate Campbell. He bounced and didn't fight Nate Campbell. He just won that belt and bounced out the division and went to the next division. And I kind of held that against Pacquiao a little bit. So I would do the same here for Mikey. So I'm glad he if if he's if he's gonna go back to 135. I'm glad this is a move he's doing because there's just there's better fights for him make more money. And these are fights that can really add, really legitimize his resume and, and go towards his legacy. If he can make, if, if he indeed makes these fights. So props to him for doing it. And like I said, I would have, fuck, I would have held it against him. I'm sorry. I just would have held it against him because these are the fights. I'd rather see him fight these guys than fight them guys at 140. I'm done, y'all. Uh, Mike? And I'm going to jump in if our host doesn't. I couldn't agree with you more, Bo. I like any fighter who moves toward a unification of their division, who wants to challenge himself with the best opponents at a certain weight class and systematically move through them. I think that that takes a lot more discipline and is a lot more impressive of an achievement. This was a good move by Mikey. You know, I know he probably considered multiple options. I, I'm glad that he apparently got good advice, listened to it, and is going this direction. Yeah, that, and you know what, too, Gail, uh, uh, the, the, the 
an- another thing that we also have to look at it at, at is that um you start jumping like Mikey's jumping that can be detrimental to to him from a health standpoint you you can't keep doing that if you try to compete at two weight divisions and jump in 140 135 then one you can't keep doing that and eventually you'll get caught so if Mikey really wants to preserve himself and you know like you said add something to and you know a decent resume and he's starting to make a comeback and people are starting to get behind him then yeah like you said go to 135 unify and fight some of these good names yeah absolutely and you know we were just talking about that earlier in the broadcast here about the guys in the smaller weight divisions playing around and jumping around you mikey isn't by any means you know old but now it is at the point of his career it may do some long-term harm to him you know yo-yo dieting like that uh, you know back and forth back and forth he could probably do it for now right now but depending on what he wants to do in the future not a good idea yeah no mike we still can't hear you so stop talking <laughs> what about now nope we still can't hear you yeah, I can we hear you. I can hear you. I've lost connection with my mic. Voice. <laughs> non flavor flavor voice. We no longer have to see here. Yes, yes, y'all. <laughs> okay. We have we have Mikey Garcia solved. Let's uh let's hit it. Yeah. Well, it's a smart move. It's a smart move for Mikey because number one, when it comes to 140, he's already shown it in the Broner fight, and he's already and he's shown it in the Lipnitz fight. His power doesn't carry well. I won't 40. But his skill might get in weight, but then he's going to run into guys like Progray, who could probably take the punch and give it back. <clears throat> Whereas in 135, yeah, you have you have Robert Easter. You have that fight you guys have been brewing. And quite frankly, if you really – if he and his team would be that set and trolling top rank – Lomachenko is right there if he beats Linares. Or if Linares beats Lomachenko, yet that fight that people have been waiting a year to do. And ultimately, though, yeah, I get the I get the whole I get the whole aspect of it of you want to go up. Like he kept talking about, like, oh, I could fight at Walter Ridge and middle weight. Yeah, he's not old, but he did he did lose two years out of his career voluntarily. That's two years he can't get back. That's two years on his body doing this, doing the grind to get weight that he can't get back. So it's best for him to settle down in the weight division that he can, which is looks to be lightweight, and try to unify there because obviously you have fights there with people that are real skill. And if and especially with the winner Lomachenko Lenatis, that winner respects a lot of legacy. So I glad I'm glad that Mikey made this move. Now I don't know what's gonna happen with the I, with the IBF belt. Obviously, Baranchik was the mandatory. I don't know who the number two is, but you know, Lipnitz gave gave enough of a show. Well, I wouldn't mind seeing him fight to get his belt back. Uh, shout out to Gus, who's also and also in the chat with us right now. Uh, uh, so I hope I sent him a link, and hopefully he can join us. Uh, go to you, Jacob. Good look, good move for uh, Michael Garcia to uh, go back down to 35. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Bo said it best. Uh, all the all the good fights are there. Um, you know, it's not a good idea to jump around. You know, for for fighters, what I want them to do uh, is, well, first of all, make weight, right? So be in a weight class that you can make weight to. Then next is fight often. And fight, you know, top competition and try to unify the division or, you know, win belts or, you know, and make a little money on uh, on the way. You know, if you're going to fight a top guy and you're a top guy, you know, there, there's money to be made there. And people are going to want to see those competitive fights. So I think it's it's nothing but the right direction. Um, last story here before we start to uh, preview fights uh, for the weekend. And uh, I didn't share this in the docket, but uh, I'm going to talk about it here on the show right now live. Looks like uh, uh, Elliot, Elliot or Alvarez, uh, who tried to uh, C-block uh, the Stevenson 
uh, uh, Baudu Jack fight, asking that he wanted the fight mandatory and, and blah, 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 uh, uh, being real petty uh, and, and, and trolling. It looks like now we're going to see him against uh, uh, Sergey Kovalev. Uh, I think May or June, or uh, uh, June, I believe, June or July. I can't remember the exact month. Uh, just going to open up for everybody here. Uh, your reaction to this news? I'm personally pleased to see it. I think it's a a good opponent. It's the right opponent. There's still a, a date to be named, and it looks like probably we're talking about late July. Uh, and a venue has yet to be named. And there's some interesting possibilities there. I, I think you have to assume that Madison Square Garden, which has become Kovalev's home, um, away from home, is a, is a lead possibility. But it's not the only possibility. So I think we're probably thinking about late July for this fight, um, which puts it probably either you know, July... 21st or 28th, something like that, for those of you planning a hit. Stub hub's open. <laughs> I bet I bet it is. I bet it is. Well, you know, you could think about whether this fight would go north of the border. And they've been willing to do that. So, you know, Canada's really, really nice in late July. Early Can word I've Heard get get your passport in order, everybody. Early, early word I heard was the garden, uh, but it's nothing uh, confirmed. That's the, that's the default. You know, Kathy Duva has a great relationship that's basically a hometown fight. And there is such a big Russian and Eastern European constituency there. There's sort of a guaranteed fan base. So that's what also makes it so uh, such a good venue for them and such a sellable venue. You know, they're almost guaranteed to make money no matter what. So uh, anything else would be you know, wavering off the expected a little bit, but I, I would not put that out of reach. Not at all. Um, reactions from everyone else regarding the um Word of Alvarez uh, fighting uh, uh, Kovalev. Uh, did you say? Did you say me, Mike? Who's your, who's your... Anybody? Anybody can jump oh, in. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Was somebody about to go? No, nah, no, nah, I was almost sneezing. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, go ahead, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> you know the the irony to this is um there there was uh, 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 there was a a situation I guess where later Alvarez was still trying to get in between the uh, Jack versus uh, a Stevens fight. And he was trying to get in between it for the simple reason of getting paid off again. And this is this. I said this in a video. I don't care who likes it or who don't like it. This is what happens when you allow a guy to sit around, do nothing, hold a spot while you continually to, pat, to, to, to pay him or whatever the case is to step aside instead of getting him completely out of the way. And uh, he didn't fight Gavazic for whatever reason. Then he started barking again. And Heyman's like, you know what? Look, tell you what, because this fight with Jack is going to go down. You know, this is the fight that's going to go down. It's already been said. This is the fight that everybody wants to see anyway. They'd rather see this. Okay, I'll give you um, I'll give you a uh, uh, Kovalev because Marcus Brown <coughs> has had, uh, he had a, some type of domestic issue so he might not be able to make the Kovalev fight because he was originally spotted for it so I'll give you this fight now he hasn't accepted it it hasn't been said he accepts it and I would be shocked if he did I'd be shocked if later Alvarez accepted that I, I would terribly be shocked if he did I, my opinion I think this is him looking for another quick payday not to do something but the problem is Kathy Duva not gonna do that if, if his name pops up they want to make that fight Duva gonna say okay yeah I'll make that fight She's not going to do that. She's going to make his ass fight. So hopefully this fight go through because this will be one of the times I'm a root for Kovalev because I want to see him knock Ali Alvarez block off. And, uh, you know, not saying I, I don't want his career to be over with, but I finally want to see him get in there, get his block knocked off so we can finally see, okay, see, you was, you was never serious to begin with. You know, so this is put up a shutter for him because you turned down Gavazic, okay, um, you've been, you know, dilly dallying around, holding, and he's still number one by the WBC. That's the, the ironic part. He's still number one by the WBC. So, you know, I hope he takes this fight because if if you're serious, 
take the Kovalev fight. That'll make a statement. That could e that could even erase, you know, you barking the first time and taking step aside. So I hope the fight get made. It's a good fight actually to get made because later Alvarez has some skill. He has some pop. Kovalev, uh, you know, he we know he had some some good skills and some pop. I think a later Alvarez could could test Kovalev in a way that uh, the previous guy couldn't test him. So it's a good fight, and I I hope they make this fight. Uh, Daniel, Jacob, your thoughts? It's a good alternative. It's a good alternative, and it's a and it does take care of a lot of things at once. Like I said, obviously Marcus Brown. Wasn't going to be involved because he's facing charges from two domestic incidents. Like one in January and one in March. Now, I think one in December and then one in March. So he has to deal with two charges, two cases. So obviously he wasn't going to be in the right mindset to be in a fight, let alone if it goes to trial. Like they said it goes to trial. Remember, he's in he's from DC. This thing is in DC. He probably wouldn't have been allowed to travel. So they clears that out of the way. Now, with Alvarez, like from, from what Boxing Scene has said in, this looks to be a case where the money that he that Yvonne Michelle was offering for step aside was less than what Kathy Duva was offering to fight Kovalev. So he'll take he's gonna take that if he's if it's just about the money, he's gonna take that fight. And you know what? It can even play some if you want to be real petty when it comes to such a logical game. He could go to Stevenson and say, I'm fighting the guy that you're too scared to fight. But that's being like in the petty in the troll game area. It's gonna it's probably gonna be. In the theater mass square garden, like Gail mentioned, there's too much of an Eastern European population here for it to not be in. The only other place I see it would be Canada. Because then you can you can make money at the Canadian dollar. So maybe even put yourself in like in a double header, because apparently Lemieux wants to fight around that almost around the same time that Kobolev wants to fight. So you could try to do a cross promotion there. And remember, it does show once again that you've that Yvonne Michelle and Kathy Duva can do business together when the situation's right. And in all honesty, like I said, Kovalev, you kind of need Mark opponent, real big name opponents, if you're not if you're not fighting Bibbo immediately to unify that belt. So it makes all the sense in the world to do it. And with Alvarez, it it'll it might actually get him out of the way for the WBC. We know the WBC sometimes when they you wind up fighting for another belt, particularly from what I've noticed when it's a WBO, they immediately remove you from the rankings or remove you from the number one spot. So it does take care of a lot of take care of a lot of things. The situation has to be as though where's it gonna be? New York or Canada? I'm going to start closing down the show here by uh, uh, previewing fights. Uh, for this hey, Mike, week. before you do that, can I say one thing real quick? Go ahead. Okay, I just want to say, like, uh, for anybody that's trying to jump on Golovkin or not Golovkin for fighting Vonis Monterosian or, or whoever he picked because he tried to get O'Sullivan, he turned it down as another guy. I, those same people that want to get on Golovkin about taking this opponent, I better find out you was, you felt that way when it came to Deontay Wilder. When Pavekin popped, and Gerard Miller and Luis Ortiz was on Deontay Wilder's butt. I better find out that you guys, uh, uh, who people who are true are complaining about what Golovkin doing, y'all better felt that same way when it come to Wilder, because too many times in boxing you got this double standard. Whether I like a guy, don't like a guy, if I've seen guys do certain things, I don't get upset about. It. I say this all the time, so I have no problem with who Golovkin's fighting and I understand why. Just like when it was Deontay Wilder, I had no problem and I understood why. So for anybody that's barking at Golovkin. You, I better find out. You was barking at Wilder the same way. Mm, mm. Interesting, though. But, but I mean, to counter that, though, Bo, and again, I respect you a lot. The reason I'm barking at him is that he's fighting a guy who's coming off a loss, who's mm -hmm. not even in his weight class, mm -hmm. and who hasn't fought in, what, a year or two years? Right. Now, but see, and that's why I said he tried to get Spike O'Sullivan, 
and he tried to get another guy, and they turned the fight down. Well, but you, but you not, why, why not the... fight as mandatory? Yeah, wait, wait, wait. I wouldn't expect him to fight a Jamal Charlo. No, 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 not, no. Not Charlo. Dervinchenko. IBF mandatory. Dervinchenko, we, we just talked about that. HBO has already said the licensing fee, they don't have enough money to to uh, uh to be able to pay both of these guys what they want for that fight. No, not not a May 5th, but they could have done it at a later date. Yes. And yeah, but Golovkin want the May 5th date though. But that's him. That's him trying to be petty. And this is the thing. Well, when it comes oh, yeah. to it, if you want to, if you want to compare the Wilder situation to the Golovkin situation, yes, they felt both of them fell, and fights were lost due to circumstances that was not in their control. Mm -hmm. It was not in their control. That I that I pretty much agree with. The problem I may have with when it comes to Golovkin in this situation is number one, yes, you're facing a guy that hasn't fought in two years. That right. I get. I get. Number like I said, number two, you're trying to do this May 5th day to, to try to prove that you're the you could be the big guy May 5th when knowing full well you could have taken care of the mandatory situation. Like I said, if you're all about the belts, you don't piss off the one sanctioning body that actually follows the rules in that aspect to it. And the whole thing is probably is the the biggest gripe I have is. This fight is the fight to tie Hopkins's record. Don't give See, me that. I, 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 I wasn't even thinking about that part of it. That I wouldn't. I, I don't want to think. I don't keep up with stuff like that. And I, I hear what you guys are saying, but you know, Chris Ariola wasn't. I mean, he replaced Povetkin and Chris Ariola. I think when was the last time he fought before he fought Wilder, and that wasn't necessarily. Uh, a fight that that I got up for it was it was a replacement fight, so yeah. I'm, I mean, should he have fought? I'm, I've seen guys when a, a fight get canceled do take on tougher opponents. We've seen before in boxing. I've also seen guys do what what I saw Wilder doing, what I seen Golovkin doing also, and that's that's my issue. Is okay, and I hear what you guys are saying. Just for me personally, every there are a lot of guys that's barking at uh, GGG just to be barking at him because they don't like him to begin with, and. It's an it's an agenda, and there's and there's the other issue that I did have. That's the other issue that I have. That fight it does feed into this like little niche of anti Triple G fans mm -hmm. that will say like, "Oh, he hasn't fight anybody, or he fights so tough." And now they'll go with this in Canelo, and Canelo fans will do this. I've seen it, where they go like, "Oh, he's not fighting Canelo now. Now he's going to try to go back to fighting bombs to pad his record," because they saw with Danny Jacobs that he no longer has it. That's a dumb. That's a dumb way of thinking. Those if Canelo fans are too. gonna go, if Canelo fans are gonna go there, they can't say that. Uh, it wasn't GGG who was one eating bad beef. It wasn't GGG who was testing positive. It was thank, Canelo. You. thank you, thank you, thank you. That's, and, that's and Canelo saying. and Canelo has had his share of soft touches too. So uh, yeah, I'm about that. to say Canelo has brought guys up from lower weight up to his weight to fight him. Uh, you know, GGG only fought Kell Brook because of the situation with. Um, Chris Eubanks, you know, he wound up fighting Brooks. Ca uh, Canelo, they accepted Khan as a challenge. So there's a huge difference there. Like, they, you just accepted this guy as a challenge. So, yeah, you know, so that, that I mean, I get what you guys are saying. I, I, re I respect you guys' stance on there, okay? But you guys know that there are people who are ragging on him just for the sake of uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. And that's not right. No, same guy. Yeah, and, and I'm a Glucking fan, not, bro. Right, and those same guys, when I threw, when Ortiz's name was being thrown out there and Jerry Miller's name, because I said it then for Wilder, I said, listen, I don't expect Wilder to fight on Lewis Ortiz on such short notice coming off of surgery and trying to fight a Lewis Ortiz. You're crazy. And I said, that's I don't expect him to try to make, to try to get that fight. And I said that. So that's why I'm not getting Carnelo uh, beef about it either. Yeah. I mean, that, Gennady Golovkin, that's why no, I'm not giving Gennady Golovkin beef. No pun intended there. Yeah, no. Right. <laughs> I, I like I said, everybody understands the circumstances where it's involved, and it's just the mere fact that it's this thing that's been carried with Golovkin mm -hmm. that is carried in that oh, he he doesn't fight competition. He's fight bombs when the division is all bombs. Now now the division is starting to look nice, and they're gonna try to attack him again because it's the easy thing to do. Yeah, which and is, it's also guys that don't know the history. He yeah. wanted to fight Sergio Martinez. Martinez told him to fight, fight Curtis Stevens because Martinez wanted to get a big money fight with Cotto. He wanted to fight yeah. Cotto. Cotto told him, well, uh, Cotto paid him step aside because Cotto wanted Carnelo Alvarez. 
All right. So it's you know, so it's not like and, and uh, uh Peter Quillen dropped his belt. He he dropped his belt to and not fight him. So it's not like DGG wasn't trying to get, you know, some of these guys. Like, like a lot of times guys don't know the history and it's better for them to go with the popular thing to say to talk crap about a guy than to actually look it up for themselves to find out what's really been going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that Sergio Martinez. Wait, I just want to say this. Wrap Martinez it up, Daniel. Wrap it up, please. Yeah. Sorry about that. With the Sergio Martinez thing, and and I, and I was a fan of Maravilla. It was known from day one. Lou Debe this words that came out of Lou Bella's mouth. I will never put Martinez with Golovkin. Mm -hmm. He said himself, "I will never put Martinez with Golovkin because I know that Golovkin is next in line, and Martinez and Martinez shouldn't be sacrificed like that." Yeah, indeed. So let's uh interesting conversation there. Let's move on to start previewing the fights. Uh now because we run impressed for time, uh, because uh uh while us dudes were having this conversation, the lone lady uh who was who's part of the show was a, a silent and, and and I don't like that. Um she should have her say or be included. I'm going to uh include her now and start her off uh previewing the fights here. Um Adrian Brown or Jesse Vargas? I mean, the fight is happening. Um, I'm pretty meh about it. Um, either, I, to be honest, I really don't care who wins. We all know Broner's issues. Uh, Jesse Vargas. I mean, he gets the opportunity. Will he take advantage of it? Um, again, I'm, I'm indifferent towards this, Gail. Your thoughts? I'm not indifferent because second only to the disgrace that is the son of the greatest fighter of Mexican history is. One said, Mr. Broner, his behavior in and out of the ring um, has been a, a just a shame, a shambles, a disgrace. He had all the natural talent and skills to work with in the world. And his poor personal habits, his laziness in training, his lack of discipline, uh, listening to people around him that, sh that took advantage of him. And shouldn't have you know the worst possible uh, rep, you know example of hangers on that are no good for you has resulted in the Adrian Broner we see before us today. This is a career prolonging fight for him. It is a must win fight for him. And if the boxing gods are merciful and just, they will allow Jesse Vargas to take him out and just shut this. <laughs> you know, unfortunate incident down once and for all. But not that I have any strong feelings about it. <laughs> Broner, Broner is the classic guy who does not only doesn't make weight, but in fact frequently would brag about not even trying. And when he was a player and an A-side and a personality that people were intrigued by, he got away with it. He never should have, but he did. And a lot of the B-side guys, you know, just had to suck it up and take a payday to walk in the ring. That's when men really get hurt. I don't like it. Uh, I don't like the disrespectful attitude. Uh, his behavior, in particular toward women, not the best. He claims he's, you know, finally found peace in his life in the right situation. And if that's true, all the best to him. I don't need to cross paths with him again. Um for what, whatever people do or don't say about Jesse Vargas, you know, he has his own detractors. He's rubbed several people in the wrong way in boxing. He's a very outspoken guy. He thinks very well of himself, very highly, probably more highly than most others do about him. But, you know, if you don't have confidence in yourself, you can't expect anybody else to. So I'll hate the matchup uh, as long as Vargas wins. Um, uh because there's so many fights uh, that's happening this weekend, I'm going to split these fights up. Um, to your point about Adrian Broner um, supposedly fi finding peace in his life and don't want no drama. If that's the case, then why is he trying to start beef with Takashi 69? I'm just saying. Um, let's move on to Scorsese because he had to dip out for a minute. He's back. Um, I'm going to ask you about uh, this fight between Jamal Charlo and Centennial. Your thoughts? Mm, it could be a bit of a toss-up, man. Centeno is hit or miss sometime. Charlo really ain't been tested at 160. Um, I haven't actually looked at the attributes of, of like, uh, both of them. 
I know Charlo better than I know Centeno, but I still got a lot of questions about Charlo. I seen him struggle boxing before. I seen him losing rounds, but didn't make the right adjustment. So is it a matter of time until he makes the adjustment a little bit too late, or, or you know, uh, or is he really just this damn good? As as his mouth has been, you know, his mouth's been running to make you think he's good. Centeno, like I said, has been hit or miss with him. Uh, got roughed up by Salaki and outboxed by him at times too. So I'm struggling mightily with J Rock, but then he gets in with a lean and and shit, he puts in work, you know. So I, I um, that's the fight of the weekend for me. That's the one I'm definitely interested in seeing. I'm gonna go with Charlo, but I'm gonna I'm gonna learn more about these two fighters after the fight than I actually know about them right now, I believe. Going to you, Bo, to talk about this next fight, uh, which is all part of a, a triple header on Showtime happening uh, Saturday at NYC. Uh, Javante Davis. Um, been interesting with him. I mean, he, he won the belt against Pedraza. Uh, looked very good in his first defense against Liam Walsh. Uh, but then he fights on the Mayweather uh, McGregor undercard. Comes in overweight, loses his belt. Um, it didn't look good in the fight, uh, which will stop uh, questionable circumstances uh, to many. Um, he returns to the ring fighting uh, uh, Cuellar, uh, I want to say, for an a, a interim belt. Um, I could be wrong about that. Um, or for the vacant regular belt, WBA, we know how that is. Um, proving um, ground for him, in my opinion, for Javante Davis, uh, given what we've seen from him in his last fight. Uh, given how he's been, quite frankly, e thugging uh, uh, on Twitter. Your thoughts, Bo? Uh, Javante Davis is quickly becoming Adrian Broner 2.0. That's just really what you know. <laughs> he is. He, you know, you know, I, see, this is I really, I hate doing, you know, one thing about like this, these generation is these, these dudes are females, man. These are emotional. Hey, 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 hey. Oh. <laughs> no, it, you know what they're not they're not females they're hoes they're hoes That's okay okay, okay yeah, i'm gonna go with, i mean but you know these dudes are all these dudes are all in their feelings all because they don't like what a dude is saying to them who happens to be a guy that at the end of the day they're talking about they're gonna be right back at his house they're gonna be right back being cool with him you know so I don't pay no I don't pay no more attention to what these dudes is doing because they 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 don't even know what they want to do. Is this gonna be a proven fight for them? Uh the Quayar fight is gonna be interesting because Quayar last fight was uh in 2016 when he lost to Abner Mares. Uh Abner Mares was able to outbox him and beat him. Uh Javante Davis, Tank Davis is more of a come forward. You know, he likes to use his power punch and everything like that. So it's gonna be an interesting fight. I think Javante Davis should be able to 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 win that fight, uh, I I just don't think Quayar has what he would need, especially being out the ring for almost two years. I just don't think he would have what he would need to go in there and be effective to the point where he could probably beat Javante Day. I think Javante Day, from a talent standpoint and just from a skill standpoint, still go in this fight. But from a mental standpoint, I, I, I'm I'm tired of him. I'm tired of bro. I'm tired of all these dudes that 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 the up here you know facebook i mean you know twitter toughen instagram toughen talking crap about a dude or about something that's being said about him because they either don't like it and then they're gonna be cool with the guy or later on cool again secondly so you know they can miss me with all of that like i said this this generation is, is this this generation of, of fighters this generation of young dude they killing me they killing me i'm not all of them but they killing me how 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 is this dude going to sit there and say Deontay Wilder's talking like a band, B A N, on Twitter, when when Wilder can pick him up by one arm and, and snap him around like a twig? Mike, you know what? You know what? I mean, Mike, here, here's the funny thing about that though. How do you talk? See, when you're focused on everybody else, this is the reason why you lost your belt on the scale. You're too busy worried about everything else instead of what you should be, which is your own business. Take care of your own business first. Then you start looking at everybody else. I ain't gonna, I ain't Why gonna are you even it. looking at somebody that's not even in your division? In, in the I, I, I spell, I say B-A-N. I'm not going to say what that means, but yeah. uh, oh, you know what I mean. By yeah, that. yeah, I know. I, I know what it means. I know what it means. Hold on. Deontay Wilder is at least 
trying verbally to pursue a fight with Joshua. When it came to Lomachenko, he was very quiet. So you can't, you can't, you were very quiet when it came to Lomachenko, Javante. So uh, not to mention a Mr. Tevin Farmer. And good thing that he's actually challenging for the WBA though, because uh Gail did break the did break the news to the guys that Anichi Ogawa, uh the guy that the guy that the vague that the Vegas judges gave the belt to instead of Tevin Farmer was stripped today. And suspended. Mm, yeah. Stripped his yep. ass. That's right. And suspended for six months. Um that was at the hearing that didn't it, the Canelo didn't end up going to because he reached a settlement in advance and he still had their hearing and uh, he's yep, because yep. he failed his pre fight drug test in December. So, yep, that uh, junior lightweight world title, IBF world title, no longer belongs to him. Yep, no longer belongs to him. And remember, it's the same type of farmer that when you were in the good graces of Floyd. He kept you as far away from him as possible because he right. embarrassed you in the right. ring. Well, now remember, Floyd Floyd threatened to feed Gervonta to Lomachenko. <laughs> yeah, that's that, what I'm that, saying. He was that, he that was is awfully a quiet. That is a paddling by daddy if I ever heard one. And he was yeah. awfully quiet when it happened, but didn't want to talk about wow. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Yeah, that and that's going to be the whole thing. What if it? Okay, and. If it doesn't turn out with Lomachenko, okay, no, I'm, I'm just going to feed you now to Tevin Farmer. I'm going to let you get the ass beaten you deserve. Indeed. Uh, going to Northern Ireland here, I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, Double header that's going to be um, aired on an interesting move. Showtime, Facebook, and YouTube Our channel is going to air this double doubleheader. Uh, Carl Frampton fighting Nonito Donaire. I believe on undercards, Alana Tete fighting his mandatory Omar Navias. I want to ask you, uh, Jacob, excuse me, Jacob, about Frampton and Donaire. For me, this is a fight of two unknowns. Uh, Frampton, he lost the rematch with uh, Santa Cruz, uh, has fought only once since. Uh, I believe he got knocked down in that fight, struggled to get the win against the Donaire. We don't know where he's at at this point of his career. Older, uh, fighting in a weight that he probably should not be fighting in. I don't I still at this point don't think he's a true featherweight. Uh interesting fight here. Uh unknown crossroad fight here uh for both guys, Jacob. Your thoughts. Yeah, this is an interesting fight because we're not sure what Frampton's uh state of mind is. You know, he split with the McGuigans. He didn't look great. He had that fight where he didn't make weight, and then the guy, uh, his opponent, fell in the bath, the, the shower, and hurt himself. So that fight got called off. And he had been talking after that loss with Santa Cruz that, you know, potentially he was going to retire or he didn't know if he wanted to fight anymore. So his, you know, boxing, a very big part of boxing is the head game, right? So if he's not in the right head game, he could be ripe for. Uh, Denari to basically come and pull the you know pull the upset you know uh, Denari has been you know he's been around for a long time great fighter is definitely past his prime but you never count out uh, a skilled old dog because you know he could you know he could still fight he could still pack a punch and if he you know can land the right shots or have the right game plan, we could be in line for an upset. So I'm very interested in this fight. It's going to tell us a lot about, you know, both fighters. Uh, quickly before I go to Daniel here, uh, Scorsese, you was asking about the, uh, why you, uh, you just came back, you were asking, did we talk about the situation with Kova Levin Alvarez? Um, yes, we did. Uh, you want to give a quick word on that? Yeah, I was, I actually just was interested in what everybody else was saying. I was just thinking, I you know, good fights like heavyweight producing. So yeah, but still, uh, this is the same Alvarez who's uh, uh was being very petty, uh, trying to intervene him intervene when it came to Stevenson Jack, uh, yeah. searching for another step aside fee, um, and now he gets this fight. Um, I'm with Bo on this one. Uh, we need to find out what he's really about. He turned the fight down with Gavastek. Uh, he gets this fight with Kovalev, but uh, like I, and, and said, I agree with Bo here. Uh, I hope he gets his butt whooped, given how <laughs> he's been acting. It's 
could be a good fight. I, I think it should be. He is strong and he he explosive. Not a not a huge puncher or nothing, but I mean explosive in the sense he reacts. And then he's you know he could be standing flat for the next thing you know he just opening up on your ass and I, I want to see the fight like I wanted to see him fight Stevenson Jack or whoever but I mean of course I want to see Stevenson Jack too but uh this Kovalev fight it does just fine with me you know um I think he feel like that may be some weakness with Kovalev a lot of people are sensing that but personally I ain't really feeling that much of that I'm trying to tell people I I I don't think there's much weakness there. Maybe Alvarez might get that ass toe up. Then again, you know, let's wait and see. They need to get a date. Um, light heavyweight just producing once again. Uh, you mentioned uh, Joe. I mean, excuse me, Bo. Um, a fight I should have talked about. A uh, fight has been made apparently. Um, Gary Russell Jr. You know, he only fights one fight a year. This will probably be his only fight of the year. I was going to fight his mandatory against uh, Jojo uh, Jojo Diaz. Bo, uh, quick word on that. Yeah, Gary Ross is gonna fight Jojo Diaz. I, you you stole my line because I was definitely gonna say, I was definitely gonna say that. Um, supposedly that fight might that fight's gonna take place in Canada. Uh, Ross is gonna fight Jojo Diaz. That's a fight that Jojo Diaz has been wanting. So it's good to see Russell uh, probably uh, finally fight. Uh, you know, I, I guess uh, we consider Jojo Diaz a top guy. But uh, after this fight, I want him to fight somebody else, and that's going to be the big key. Is he gonna fight again? Is he gonna take a year off? He'll probably take the year off. They, if he they, wins. Moved, they moved it to Ox and Hills to um, the new um, MGM out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Maryland. Yeah, it's okay. going to be a split site. It's gonna split okay, split yeah, that's right. That's right. They did. They did. They moved it to Maryland. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, a level prize. It's a good, I mean, it's a good fight. I'm, I'm just not, I'm not like extremely impressed by Jojo Diaz, but I'm just glad to f finally see Gary Russell fight somebody that I can look at and be like, okay, you know. You know, but it's just, it's just sad to me. It takes a mandatory for this dude to, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to come fight my mandatory and I'm, I'm bouncing for a year. That's. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last fight is a, a, a preview segment here before we start shutting uh, things down. Daniel, um, on the undercard of Frampton Donaire, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, one of my favorite fighters, uh, regardless of weight, Zelana Tete. Defeating his WBO bantamweight belt against mandatory um, Omar, Omar Navias. I mean, listen, uh, it's a mandatory. He has to do it, uh, get it out the way. But Navias, 42, I believe. Um, yep. Never been an offensive fighter. Uh, last time most folks saw Navias against uh, non Nonito Donaire, and he fought in a defensive shell all night long just to go the distance, just to say he went the distance with Don uh, Donaire, who was to many folks top five pound for pound. Uh, I just don't see uh, Novaya as having much of a chance here uh, against uh, the talent of uh, Zolana Tete, who I believe right now is the best bantamweight in the world. Yeah, that's this is going to be an interesting fight because we have to remember, like HBO had the debut, an American debut, in, in address to American TV audiences to now a new way last year. Superfly. This is technically Zolani Tete's American TV debut, even though it's not really going to be in TV. It's going to be streamed on Showtime app. They're going to stream it on Facebook, and they're also going to stream it on their YouTube channel. So it's going to be interesting to see how it's going to look because it's all signs are pointing to right now, probably the next big fight for Tete would be in way. So it has to be something where a fight where we know what he's getting as an opponent. It's a mandatory, and he'll. I'd he be impressive. Or I'd be impressive with if any way actually takes that bout. I'd be very impressed by him doing yeah. that. That's a that's a holy shit fight if that happens. Yeah, that that and yeah, but and that's the fight they probably want in the horizon. That's a fight that if if you're following the Golovkin plan of trying to put yourself in and put yourself in as many markets as possible. If you're a new way, okay, you you vote you establish yourself in Japan. You're already considered in many ways a top dog there. You now go to the US. People now know your name here in the US. Why not do that? Go to the go to the UK. Face a fighter there that pe many people can consider the top class. Like I said, sans Luis Neri. So 
that is going to be a very interesting fight. It, obviously, Tete has to impress. It doesn't have to be like a clear cut knockout of the year candidate, but it has to be a highlight real one. Or a fast yes. one like his last fight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 10 seconds? Yep. Yes, yeah, Solano Tete, I forgot. He holds the record for now for the fastest knockout in boxing history in the championship fight. So if he can do that, yeah, all signs to me are pointing to an Inoue fight because obviously, like I said, that if he's stepping up there in 118, that's the biggest fight you can make in 118 right now. Indeed, I think we're going to start to uh, shut the show down on that note. Uh, going to go around the uh, uh, panel here, uh, starting with ladies first. Uh, as I begin the show with ladies first, um, Gail from Communities Digital News. Uh, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk Game of Thrones, Dancing with the Stars, uh, public relations, and uh, let the folks know where they can find you. And let the folks know uh, you're going to be appearing on a, uh, a podcast with an uh, interesting subject matter that you were discussing with us uh, prior to the show. Yeah, I'll, I'll tip you all off on that, and then I'll let you know when it's posted. But in the meantime, you can find me on Communities Digital News. That's com, C-O-M-M, Digi, D-I-G-I News, comdiginews.com. Just now, finally posting the whole Golovkin story of the day. Uh, also recently had a very entertaining discussion with Big Baby. Big Baby. And we'll be talking about him next week, I'm sure. Always The always entertaining Jarrell Miller. Uh, I'm going to participate in a podcast that's actually in my profession, my day job, which is in public relations. Uh, the, the podcast focuses on how industries make a shift and a change due to public opinion. And in this case, we're going to be talking about how boxing shifted after the Mancini versus Kim fight in 1982. Really a good subject and a very interesting take on an episode that a lot of us in boxing know very well. So when that is ready to go, we will let you know. And thank you, Michael, for allowing me to uh, make a little book. Uh, no problem. No no problem. For those younger fans out there who don't know what Gail's talking about, Mancini Kim, she's talking about uh, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, Dooku Kim, fight took place in November 82 uh, on national television, network television. Boxing on network television. ABC network television, as I recall. CBS. CBS, yeah. Yeah, yeah, boxing on network television. What a novel concept. Huge uh, audiences at that time, you know? Huge. Mancini Mill tens won. of millions of people watched at that yeah. time. Mancini won by 14th round KO. Uh, tragedy ensued as uh, Dooku Kim uh, went into a coma, subsequently died um, after that bout. Uh, and there was a lot of uproar following that bout, even calls for the sport for a ban um, of the sport in the aftermath of it. And for Mancini, he was never the same. He was never the same from a, a mental, uh, psychological uh, uh, aspect. So, and there was a lot of changes subsequently um, in the sport uh, uh, in the aftermath of that. So that's gonna be a, a very um, interesting uh, topic. Um, Scorsese, you just heard him. He had to uh, uh, dip out once again. Thank him for joining us on the show. Uh, if you want to talk boxing with him, you can check him out at his uh, G Plus YouTube channel, uh, Low Place hashtag MLPF. If you want to talk boxing with him on Twitter, you can check him out at, at my low place. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Daniel from the Inscriber, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science, for those who want to talk the NBA, particularly the Miami Heat, who are in the playoffs right now. Shout out to D, to D Wade and his game, too. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you. Yes, uh, Father Prime showed up in game two. And let's see, there, there's a there's a very good chance that Joel Embiid will play in Game Three. I'm just wondering if Gabrielle Union got that uh, gave him that surprise that she promised him at the end of the game. That's all. I'm <laughs> there's so many memes in that. Uh, but yes, he can find me on Twitter uh, at Rockers99. Um, I'm planning to do the show on Friday with the fo folks at FourBoxNews.com with Jordan Francis. Francis, unfortunately, a little bit under the weather right now. Where we'll preview most of this. A lot of this fight and definitely excited. If these last few days have been eventful, we're going to see what's going to happen in the weekend because a lot of what's going to be said in some divisions will be sh will be shaped up by the end of this weekend. I uh, want to give a shout out to those who joined us in the chat again. Big shout out to Wingy Boxing, uh, uh, one of the more popular uh, folks here on on the um, YouTube boxing community. Big shout out to him. Shout out to Fink. Uh, shout out to Gus. 
uh, for joining us on the show. Thank everybody, those fellas, uh, for joining us on the show. Uh, going to uh, Jacob from Jab Hook, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science, for those who want to talk movies. Let the folks know where they can find you. Yeah, first off, uh, thanks, Mike. And uh, yeah, shout out to everybody on the, on, uh, on the chat and all the listeners. Uh, again, uh, if you know anybody who likes boxing, um, the thing I love about this show is that just like the conversation me, Daniel, and Bo just had, in regards to it was it was respectful you know there wasn't a bunch of yelling and and you know everybody got to say their points so you know i, I respect those guys a lot and everybody on the panel so uh, it's it's real good boxing talk you know everybody's very knowledgeable so like i say i learn something new almost all, all the time so i appreciate you guys having me on but i could be fine at twitter jratm23 and if you want to talk movies uh boxing that, that's basically what i do and or if you want to catch me at a live fight I'll I'll be at the Stub Hub for those two dates, and I'll be at the Staples for the uh, uh, Mares versus Santa Cruz rematch. And last, but certainly not not le- last, but certainly not least, uh, just coming off of vacation, uh, both from Truth and Facts and Boxing. Uh, for those who want to uh, talk to Sweet Science, uh, for those who want to uh, follow the adventures of you and your daughter, uh, for those who are in the app game, you're an app developer as well. You got a couple of apps going around. Got a couple of apps around. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you and mention those apps and mention three Kings. Cause I know you're part of part of that as well. Yes. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm always glad to be here. Um, of course, Mike had to say the best for last. Cause you know, that's, that's just how it goes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When you're numero uno, that's what happens for you right here. <laughs> and uh, the reason why there was no yelling with Jacob, but between me, Jacob and uh, Daniel, because they know I'm right and they're wrong. But um, no, <laughs> no, hey, no. We always gotta get, we gotta respect our elders. So. Wow. <laughs> hey, nothing will ever beat my birth certificate on the back of the Ten Commandments. That will ne- nothing ever beat that. One. <laughs> my, my my son said that one. That was the, that took the cake. But uh, speaking of which, uh, he's not dying, so I can say it. I'm proud of him. He got all A's, made the honor roll. So I'm definitely proud of him of that. Congrats, youngin. Congrats. Yeah, now he'll never listen to this show, so I ain't worried about him hearing it. Uh, congrats, but, uh, congrats to you too, Bo. Good parenting, man. You know, kids are hey, kids are a part of you know the parents that, that lead them, so you know you're doing a good job. Well, that's also my wife. She she will listen to the show, so that's that's also my wife. So I got to give her her credit. <laughs> Shout out her. to the missus. Shout out to the missus. Yeah, but um, you can find me, of course, truth and facts about boxing. Also, you can catch me on Twitter at capital T for truth underscore cap F for back fact box one along with Instagram. Of course, uh, you can catch some of my articles that I've written and other guys have written at uh, three kings boxing.com. Even Mike has actually uh wrote um uh, an article there. Yes. Uh, you can uh, at there, uh, you know, hashtag moving umbrella. Uh, shout out to Gail, who was the very first one who wrote the article, What Carnello Needs to Do for this fight which is take himself out of the equation so shout out to her and it, it actually happened like that you see when a woman you, you see what happened when a powerful woman speaks even if she is five foot one but you see when a powerful woman speaks what happens well thank you for thank you for exaggerating that height just <gasps> time yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> small small but mighty we are we are just like the pound for pound report we are small but mighty. most indeed, definitely indeed. did be on the lookout did be on the lookout um uh, a, a young man by the name of um, Williams Wallace, who was the founder and CEO for Food for Soul, reached out to me through Yolanda Cortez, and they want to do a show with me because he is looking at getting kids into boxing training. So that's uh, we're gonna I'm gonna be doing an interview with that to talk more about that, and I'm very excited about that because uh, uh, it's uh, you know to be able to give back to the community or to inspire the community and talk to people that's actually doing it. That's always a pleasure. And, it's always good being here on Pound for Pound Boxing, man. It's good boxing talk, uh, like corresponding with all you guys right here. And, you know, this is, like I said, I was half asleep, but fortunately my teenager woke me up and I was able to make a good show, great conversation, pound for pound, man. You you just can't beat it. Um, and let the folks know where they, they can find your apps. Oh, yeah, you can find, if you have uh, Android, uh, we starting to get some of the apps on, on for iTunes. Uh, it's um, Vanity. No, what was it again? No, Apollonia. Apollonia Media. I just type in Apollonia Media, the app store, and you'll see the games. And uh, then uh, there will be some new uh, videos of me and my daughter coming out. She's getting older, so I'm going to have to uh, – the videos won't 
won't be as much a uh, 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 what's a collision as they are because she's getting older and she hit she's starting to hit and do things a lot harder. And my body can't take it. <laughs> uh, if you like what you've heard uh, uh, on Facebook on YouTube, excuse me, uh, please hit that like button. Please hit hit that subscribe button. I'm um, also please check us out on iTunes and uh, subscribe there as well and um, leave a comment. Love to hear from you. Love to hear from you on SoundCloud. A uh, five star review on um, itunes uh, i will read on the show um as i said before if you want to check out all things box all things pound for pound box report blog page the place to go to p4p uh, box report uh, dot wordpress dot com um on the next episode we will do a recap uh we'll do a recap of brona vargas of charlo centeno javante davis cuellar frapped and donair as well as uh tete and novias and well, we we will do a preview of um. It's going to be a really really grudge match here uh, between Jesse Magdaleno uh, defending his WBO Junior Featherweight belt against some um, Isaac Dogbo. Um, a lot of trash talk back and forth, uh, particularly some of the controversial comments of uh, uh, Dogbo, his father. Um, that's going to happen um, in Philadelphia on ESPN on the 28th on the undercard of that fight. Brian Jennings. Bryant Jennings will fight also um, on the 28th. Um, Daniel Jacobs will make his return to the ring against um, Selecki. Um, Big Baby Miller is going to fight on that undercard, as well as Katie Taylor going to fight Victoria Bustos um, in a unification bout at lightweight. Uh, trying to find any other interesting bouts. So we would, now we're going to talk about those bouts um, in particular. So uh, for Gail Communities Digital News, uh, for Sc- Scorsese, who was on the show earlier with us, uh, Daniel from The Inscriber, Jacob from Jab Hook, um, Bo from Truth and Facts, as well as Three Kings Boxing. Um, I am your host, Michael. This has been episode 205 of the Pound for Pound Box Report. Let me say, uh, uh, ladies love episode uh, coming up round four, I think, three or four, one of them, but our annual ladies love boxing episode, all women talking all things boxing. That's coming up, looking to have it uh, next month, so be on the lookout for that. So again, Episode 205 with Pound for Pound Boxer Report. And also, um, if you're listening to us, SoundCloud, YouTube, uh, uh, iTunes, or whatever, um, if you're a, a, a woman who's a boxing fan and would like to take part, uh, hit me up. Hit me up uh, on Twitter, on my personal Twitter, uh, at BrotherJR76. Uh, or hit me up, Pound for Pound Boxer Report, Twitter, at P4P Boxing Report. Hit me up and see what we can do. Um, again, episode 205 with Pound for Pound Boxer Report. I'm your host, Michael Fagel. For Bo, for Scorsese, Daniel, Jacob, we will all see you guys next time. Everyone have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Shout out to Chris Madison, Kevin Iofi, having a nice Twitter fight tonight. <laughs>